two reports. Great. Good evening and welcome to the Beverly Hills Unified School District Special Board Meeting Study Session. Today is March 4th, 2022. It is now 4.43 p.m. Um, may I have a, may I call, I'm going to call the session to order. And uh, Rochelle, would you like to lead us in the slide salute? Oh, sure, of course. Okay. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can we have the approval of the agenda? So moved. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 4 0 with a preferential vote from Eli Raymer. Uh, 5 0. Oh, 5 0. Thank you. Um, okay, Dr. Brady, any report from closed session? Uh, there was no action in closed session, President Wells. Thank you so much. Okay, now we have the agenda hearing period, public comment. The first person that we'll hear from is Donna Triffman. Her time has been seated by Michelle Nazar. And Donna, you have six minutes. Are you there? there you I'm are. here. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, dear Board of Education, members of the cabinet and all district volunteers, this comment refers to item 8A on the agenda, the presentation by the CCAC committee. First, the CCAC board subcommittee, as it's described in the 2018 facilities manual, was suggested by a presentation by Don Blake in May of 2018. Thereafter, there was supposed to be a period of application culminating with board appointments by August 2018. The members were thereafter chosen by Don Blake, not by the Board of Education in a public meeting. The committee was to have approximately five to six members, but it only has three. The purpose of the CCAC committee was to help the Board of Education provide accountability to the Beverly Hills community while minimizing risk in advising the board with respect to implementation of designated construction projects. The CCAC was to meet regularly and act as a sounding board for the issues brought by the facilities committee and the construction manager. Importantly, the CCAC was required to provide reports not less than quarterly, meaning at least four times a year at a regular board meeting. Thus, it is surprising that this is the first time we hear from the CCAC committee. Trust starts with truth and it ends with truth. So what is the truth here? In Don Blake's October 21, 20. 21 presentation, he reported that the program is at a shortfall of $129 million. But in the CCAC committee report today, the number has magically dropped from $129 million to $69 million shortfall. Both conclusions are speculative as the GMPs have not yet been determined. So what do we actually know? We know we don't have enough money to finish and it's that simple. According to Mr. Goldstein from his application to the board a few months ago, he understands that the board is metaphorically standing on a rooftop providing oversight to the district, and that is what this board must do. It is encouraging that the board is looking at this construction program from the critical eye of oversight, because at the end of the day, the board is a fiduciary to the community, and this is the third time some community members are coming forward and saying, uh oh, we don't have enough money to finish. It's time to get solutions and plans that encourage spending within our means, not encouraging more expenditure by a committee wholly controlled by the vendor standing to benefit. Why hasn't the CCAC provided an alternative plan if the district does not procure the additional funding? Don Blake has not been back to present an alternative to the board since his master plan presentation on October 21, 2021, identifying a serious shortfall. This is not good planning. Of course, modern facilities attract families. It's the same pitch that was made in November 2018 by Mr. Margo and Mr. Goldstein during their presentation regarding Measure BH. They said that Measure BH would complement Measure E and everything would be covered by both and we'd be done with everything way before we will be. Of course, there is escalation. The escalation was included in the original pitches as well. Effective boards understand and respect their community's diverse range of opinions. The CCAC is comprised of three people in this community only. Members were not elected by the community nor appointed by the board. They were chosen by Don Blake. When Mrs. Marcus stated she wanted to implement a facilities construction committee that would operate in public with meetings and agendas and minutes, Don Blake stated that he would take it under advisement, quote. 
In the CSAC, um, in the CSAC, while sitting on the CBOC as well, Mr. Run served on both concurrently. Another member serves on the CCAC and the FCC as its chair. How can a member provide oversight of the construction program yet serve on another committee appointed by the construction manager? CCAC meetings are not public. These meetings have no agenda and these meetings have not had any minutes. We simply just don't know what is going on there. What the CCAC presents tonight is doom and gloom when what should be presented is an alternative to spending more money. We have money left in the measures. Let's start spending within our means and figure out the planning for what we can actually do. Regaining community trust is the crucial starting point for real and sustained improvement. Trust is built on honest consistency and must start with the truth and end with the truth. It's time for the truth. The buck stops here. Thank you for your consideration, everyone. Have a pleasant weekend. Take care. Thank you, Donna. Uh, the next person that we'll hear from is Diana Safradi. She may not be there. No? No, I'm here. Okay. Uh, next, we'll hear from Edward Montoya, and you have three minutes, Edward. No. Uh, and next is Sigali Sabag. Marjan, are you there? President Wells, there is one person in the waiting room who did not enter the room under the name that we recognize, so we're unable to allow them into the meeting. It just says IFA. Um, Marjan, are you here? Yeah, you want to go to the next person? She's the last. Oh. I think the other one submitted. Some people who could have been for the meeting on Tuesday. Oh, okay. Um, well, unless Marjan pops up in the next minute, I'm going to less than a minute. <laughs> I'm going to move on to our next agenda item. It looks like she's trying, though. Okay, Marjan, you're there. We're sorry, we're going to move on. Um, we're going to go to the agenda item eight study session, 8A, which is the Citizens Construction Advisory Committee report. Um, and good evening. Um, We'd like to take this opportunity to uh, introduce the CCAC team, uh, Mr. Goldstein, uh, Mr. Fenton, and Mr. Run. And um, uh, I know that we're limited on time. Um, I did share with the board um, some biographical information, so we have an opportunity to read through that information. Um, and I will turn this right over to Mr. Goldstein. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Breggy. Good afternoon, President. Uh, you're muted, Mr. Goldstein. Uh, they must let me in. You have to do it on your end. No, no it's we're on. Good. We got Go it. ahead. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Breggy. Good afternoon, President Wells, Vice President Margo, and Board of Education. On behalf of the CCAC, thank you in advance for your time, consideration, and attention. Uh, Rebecca, do you have the presentation there? I sure do. We can put it up for the uh, board and the community. All righty, if you can go to the slide that shows the next slide, please. And the next slide. Great, thank you. Before Los Angeles was known for producing movies, it was known for producing oil. LA used to be a small town until the late 1800s when in 1892, Edward Doheny, for whom Doheny Drive is named, discovered oil wells near present day Dodger Stadium. By 1914, California produced nearly 40% of the nation's supply of crude oil. The LA Basin generated nearly 25% of the world's oil production. Beverly Hills High School was built in 1927 by the Los Angeles High School District. 
a decade later, the residents of Beverly Hills would vote to form the Beverly Hills Unified School District. Next slide. In this photo from 1928, BHHS can be seen in the center left with an active oil field abutting the campus. Most oil fields in Beverly Hills turned out to be a bust, so the owner, Burton Green, an oil baron for whom Burton Way is named, decided to venture into real estate. He named the newly planned community after his hometown, Beverly Farms, Massachusetts. Next slide. In 1927, BHHS opened. This is an aerial photograph of the high school property taken March 1928. The entire campus sits directly on top of the western end of the Beverly Hills oil field. Next slide. In 1959, Beverly Hills Board of Education entered into an agreement to lease a portion of the southwest campus of BHHS for oil and gas extraction. Under the lease, BHUSD received a 5% royalty share of oil and gas production. In 1978, the Beverly Hills Board of Education added the city of Beverly Hills to the oil lease agreement. And for the next 40, uh, four decades, the district shared royalties with the city of Beverly Hills. In 1996, Venico LLC became the operator of the oil and gas producing wells located on the site of the district's only high school. Venico acquired the rights by transfer from a predecessor entity. Next slide. And next slide, thank you. In 2011, the Beverly Hills City Council voted to ban oil drilling within the city limits. The ban went into effect December 31, 2016, bringing to an end decades of oil gas production on the city's portion of the Beverly Hills oil field. The decision to cease oil extraction meant a loss of millions of dollars in future royalties for the school district. The CCAC highlights the district's history of oil extraction to emphasize to this board and community that a decision made nearly a century ago by the Los Angeles High School District, the original owners of the property to build Beverly Hills High School on an active oil field and subsequent decisions by, made by prior school boards in 1959, 1978 and 1996 to continue to lease high school property for oil and gas extraction continues to plague the BHUSD to this day. Next slide. Just last month, the city of Los Angeles also banned oil and gas extraction. So what's the hard part? The hard part is figuring out who would pay for the well remediation. Next slide. In 2016, Venico filed for bankruptcy. In 2017, a bankruptcy judge ruled Venico, pursuant to federal bankruptcy law, had no obligation to remediate the BHHS site. The question of who would pay for the remediation of the wells was answered not Venico. Next slide. The cost to remediate all the oil and gas wells on the high school property will total $93 million. Most legacy and gas wells in California were discarded in the early 1900s when state and local oversight was non-existent. Virtually no records exist regarding the drilling and abandonment of these wells. BHUSD has identified three additional legacy wells that still require remediation before the state will allow the district to commence high school South Campus athletic field improvements. The cost to abandon the three remaining legacy wells are estimated at $21 million. Despite the city of Beverly Hills receiving oil and gas royalties for nearly four decades, the city of Beverly Hills has only contributed $11 million toward well remediation. Due to BHUSD's lawsuit against MTA, Metro was obligated to pay $22 million for the Wolf Skill 23 and Rodeo 107 legacy oil well remediation. BHUSD has spent $39 million to remediate the Venico site. The remaining three legacy wells will cost the district an additional $21 million. Unless some other government entity, either federal, state, or local, steps in to offset those remediation costs, BHUSD will have paid a total of $60 million out of its construction bond for oil well remediation on its high school property. I do thank you for your time and attention to this section. Mr. Run will now discuss the CCAC's role and oversight of the district's construction program. Next slide. Mr. Run. All right, good evening. Um, 
And thank you for this opportunity to present. Um, I know there's a lot of information that's, um, that people look at, and I just wanna share um, what the CCAC has looked at over a period of time. You know, I became an interested in this construction program uh, when my daughter uh, started the seventh grade, which was about nine years ago. That's when we came uh, into the Beverly Hills Unified School District. And honestly, I was kind of horrified at what the facilities in Beverly Hills uh, looked like. They didn't look much different than when I graduated from uh, Elderdale School in 1978. My daughter came into the school from an independent school. I came in from uh, into the Beverly Hills schools from a school in Overland Park, Kansas. And honestly, both were much nicer than Elderdale. So I mean, I didn't really know how to get involved. So I applied, uh, was selected to be on the C CBOC. And I started to gather a lot of information. And what I became was a, a critic of the program. I was a critic of what the district was building, the district's management of the program. And I was trying to see if there was anything I could do to help advance um, this program uh, for the district. The CBOC is your only uh, required committee by law of all the committees, um, of all your board committees. That is your only required committee, but its function is somewhat limited by virtue of the education code. Meanwhile, I was you know, amassing a fair amount of data. I rewrote uh, the performance audit scope and took the deeper dive, which I was able to do in conjunction with the uh, CCAC. One of the initial data sets that the, CA, that the CCAC reviews are the annual Measure E and BH uh, performance and financial audits to evaluate the effectiveness and efficiency of internal controls to provide Dr. Breggy and those charged with district construction governance, such as your bond manager, your construction manager, and your CBO, with recommendations to improve the program's performance and operations. These are not part of the CBOC duties. These are different duties. When the, CBO, when the CCAC was first convened, it reviewed the Measure E performance audit for the period of July 2016 through June 2017, to determine a baseline for the program's performance and noted 15 significant internal control de deficiencies relating, related to the lack of specific compliance with bond program requirements, the effectiveness, and again, the efficiency of the operations in areas such as uh, expenditure controls, program management, budgetary management and change orders, proc procurement controls, and claim avoidance. In 2017, the district contracted with a TCDS to serve as the bond manager. Um, and about a year later, uh, Pro West came on as the uh, construction program manager. The CCAC made implementation recommendations related to our observations identified in the uh, audits of measures E and BH. As a result of the most recent audits, in fact, the performance of the program has improved. Um, the BHUSD uh, and the management teams have developed and implemented policies and procedures, which we did not have previously. So we actually now have a construction policy manual as a district. Um, we've, the, we have experienced professionals in ProWest and TCDS who have worked on these types of programs. The district has, to the extent available, utilized other revenue sources to maximize the impact on our bond program, on our bond funds, such as the use of developer fees. And the district owns software to actually map construction management program software to manage the programs. Finally, to strengthen our internal controls, the district contracts with Keystone Solutions to support the reconciliation of expenditures. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. One of the recommendations of the CCAC was the closeout um, or forensic audit of the completion of buildings B1 and B2 on the high school campus. The significance of this audit is that it fully assesses the first project that TCDS and ProWest collaborated on. The board approved the audit firm of Moss Adams to perform the closeout validation for uh, B1 and B2. 
The primary focus of the closeout validation was to confirm the services as outlines um, based on the construction based on the construction contract. So in fact, they reconciled the final contract to the final project, confirmed that management act, action plans determine the district at closeout con that the um, excuse me that the closeout was implemented consistent with the internal controls and analyzed the final cost uh, in connection with the uh, construction. This is the first time that I'm aware that the BHUSD undertook this type of evaluation, which I believe was beneficial for the district management. We, in connection with the final closeout audit, in fact, again, several good practices were identified um, by the auditors. We have stronger program expenditure documentation, strong collaboration amongst the district and the um, managers, uh, program managers. And in fact, at one time, there was limited interaction even between the construction program and the business office in this district. So I think the uh, forensic audit really shows that the, um, the benefits was very beneficial to the district. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I think we have a, as you're aware, the, um, and I think you've heard this before, that the guaranteed, the G, the uh, guaranteed maximum price of the GMP contract was almost $66 million which was approved by the board, and the total project cost was a little under $57 million, resulting in a savings to the district of about $9 million. Um, the pencil was really sharpened for the, we, they had multiple um, sub-trade bidders, um, building um, B1, B2 was really on time and on budget and all, was on time and on budget. Horace Mann started out in 2006, 2008 as a small two-story, uh, $40 million building uh, located next to the auditorium. By the time that project was final, the scope had evolved into an $80 million uh, project. I think in the last couple of weeks, the district received or received a presentation, if we can go to the next slide briefly, uh, received a presentation on the uh, Democrat demographic analysis and enrollment projections. Um, the facilities, I think one of the things that can be read from the demographic study, and if we can go to the next slide, is that the facilities are in fact one of the issues that may be impacting enrollment in the district. We do have the facilities, we do have the capacity, we just need to better the facilities that the district has. I think the auditors or the uh, demographic analysis points out, in fact, that um, Horace Mann, when it was completed in 2016, there were um, more students enrolling in the school and tracking the cohort sizes um, from one year to the next. And hopefully, uh, as other Ellerdale comes back online, you will see um, similar increases um, if to the extent that the facilities are a deciding factor for, uh, for families. Um, thank you for your attention. I'd like to turn this over to uh, Ted Fenton to make um, a portion of the presentation. Hi, uh, everyone uh, here. Will see me? I'm not sure if I can speak back. Uh, so thank you, Jason. And um, hello, Dr. Breggy and, and members of the board. Um, I, who, are, who are in attendance. Uh, by way of background, um, up until last year, I had three kids in the district. Uh, this year I have two. Uh, I first became aware of the, the various construction issues in the district when my oldest was in first grade at El Rodeo and the board uh, discovered that the, the mass of Coppola uh, had become dislodged and uh, he was moved out of the classroom and into pods for the remainder of his time at El Rodeo until he and his brothers were moved over to Hawthorne uh, when the construction commenced at El Rodeo. Little did I know, or my wife, the time that we know that this would be only the beginning of a long story that has yet to have a happy ending. 
we moved to Beverly Hills so that our kids could have the kind of elite public educational local community experience that my wife had who attended Hawthorne at Beverly High. My wife and I both got involved to the extent we could uh, to do whatever we could to help, uh, be it my wife from the PTA, both of us involved in two bond committees, and now I on the CCAC. I was originally asked to consider uh, joining the CCAC because of my background in real estate development. I know Dr. Bregge gave you um, uh, at least a snippet on my background. I don't need to get into that, but it is uh, almost a quarter century in, in real estate and about $9 billion of deals, um, over half of which has been development. I was skeptical of the process. I was skeptical of the capabilities to get this massive project off the ground, let alone complete it, and worried about how the entire process would unfold, certainly given how things started for us in the district with our children. Uh, I eventually joined the CCAC, not for all of that, but for my kids and for the children of the district who have attended substandard neglected facilities for too long. I tried to help, I joined to help my community. Uh, when I first got involved in the district, the kids were moved into pods without a plan of action. Uh, previous boards couldn't agree on moving forward with a bond that sadly failed with a fairly high 64% of positive vote. Our facilities were poorly overseen and we had issues with our construction manager, facilities management, on and on. DSA and trades contractors in the area and throughout the state thought that Beverly Hills was a mess, didn't really want to touch us with a 10 foot pole and rightfully so, we were. But um, I'm here to say that over this period of time and from my viewpoint, my experience in the CCAC and my investigations, we've come a long way. Uh, buildings one and uh, B1 and two have been completed, uh, came in under budget on time, actually early and came out beautifully. Uh, in my opinion, we are on the right course, albeit with bumps on the road. Uh, I'm in a business where in the construction development business, we all are facing them, but our bond management and our building program is working. It ain't broke. So as the saying goes, I don't think we need to fix it. Does it mean we need to monitor it? Does it mean we need to tweak? Absolutely. Does it mean we need to throw it out and stop what we've done and not finish what we started? Uh, I don't believe that's the right course of action. We should stay on course, finish what we started with the team that we brought in to do the work and, and finish this school district. That's something we can, our children can, can appreciate and we can all be proud of. So with that, uh, I'll get into where, where we are. Um, Oh, you know what? Let me make sure. Oh, yeah, good. Okay. Um, next. So what, first, we'll talk about cost escalation and market conditions. Uh, next slide. Uh, as we all know, and as we know, when we go to the grocery store, to the gas station, uh, and watch the news, and frankly, and, and you know, do it yourself at home, um, or in my business, in actual real estate development, uh, we've all been hit by a 40 year spike in inflation and, and costs and supply chain uh, issues. Uh, this has hit every aspect, certainly of the construction business, uh, public works, uh, even worse. Um, next slide. Um, you know, this slide shows that, you know, in 2021, material prices were up 20%. But what it doesn't say is that in 19, uh, in 2020, they were also up close to 20%. And what it doesn't also say is that labor constraints have not just driven inputs, but the ability to get labor and, uh, and the cost, uh, the increasing cost of that labor. Uh, next slide. Um, this slide shows just the various uh, material input jumps in price. Uh, and frankly, it doesn't even cover everything. Um, uh, lumber prices by um, thousand board feet went from, you know, ranged an average of three to 400 pre-pandemic to a jump to 1700. Uh, a, over a fourfold increase. It came down to 800, it's now still around 1200. So a threefold increase from pre-pandemic when we were uh, estimating these costs. Uh, this is up and down the entire supply chain. Uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately, uh, demand has been much more than people thought, but unfortunately, no one in the sector, no one in the mills, uh, no one who was producing the materials uh, thought that was gonna be the case. So as production ramped down, um, demand has, has continued to surge. Um, costs have spiked through the roof and made construction uh, very difficult to project, uh, predict uh, the amount of escalations. And frankly, everyone in my business has been wrong uh, and we couldn't possibly have uh, you know, anticipated the spike in prices that we've seen over the last two years. Uh, next slide. Uh, this just shows the, uh, the month over month and 12 month percentage changes. Obviously you can see uh, going back to the end of 20, when uh, production uh, waned, but demand surged, uh, what happened to uh, the producer price index? So next slide. 
So where are we uh, on the numbers today? Uh, there were some comments earlier about change in numbers. Well, anytime you're doing an adaptive reuse where, where you're using existing buildings and you're going into the walls, uh, you, you don't know what you're gonna find. It, it's one of the issues with trying to maintain old historic buildings as opposed to building new. Uh, th there were some numbers that were given last year that had assumed worst case scenario. And thankfully, actually in this particular case, once we dug, got into the walls and, and saw the condition of the footings, uh, actually things were a little bit better than, than that worst case scenario that was discussed last year. Uh, also those numbers and you know, our $69 million shortfall and, and even the number that was given last year, um, that number did not include uh, this, the SSMP um, reimbursement, our $69 million, it does. So um, that's our mid-range case of what we believe that we'll get back for the $20 million of SSMP reimbursements once the, once the application is filed. Uh, unfortunately, you just can't book that, that positive cash flow until the application is filed. But the $69 million is what, what the CCAC, what, what our bond manager believes the cost to complete of all the work would be. Uh, that includes the $21 million of the legacy wells that Howard alluded to earlier. That does also include the $20 million of SSMP uh, reimbursement. Uh, the Rebecca, could you advance the slide, please? Thank you. Right. I'm sorry. Thank you, Howard. Yeah, I thought I was on that. It's on my screen. So, yeah, so the $68 million is the, the, the cost to complete. Uh, the $20 million is the SSMP uh, seismic mitigation. So the $48 million, but then the $21 million to uh, abandon and remediate the legacy wells of the additional 21 gets us back up to $69 million. Uh, next slide. So um, this cash flow summary uh, was validated by Key Analytics, it's a subsidiary of California Financial Services. Um, Key Analytics uh, provides uh, project revenue and expenditure tracking and reporting. Uh, and so, you know, note that the anticipated El Rodeo SSMP cannot be booked as revenue. So therefore they're showing the $89 million that, that we discussed, but, uh, you know, less than 20 million gets us to the 69. But these numbers have been audited and validated by third parties. Uh, next slide. I think part of what's really critical um, to discuss and understand in all this is to decide whether or not the program is working. Are we on the right course? Is why is there a shortfall? Well, for one thing, I discussed escalations in the market. Um, no one uh, could have possibly predicted the escalations in costs that have occurred over the last two, two years. They're, um, they're historic. I mean, we haven't seen inflation like this in 40 years. We haven't seen a two-year run up in costs. Certainly not in my career, and I can't think back to whenever over a two-year period they've escalated to this extent. Uh, if you look at um, the $21 million of the legacy, the additional legacy well remediation, um, you know, in pull that out, we are, you know, less than 6% uh, over the total budget. And frankly, there's an additional $27 million of cost. 20 million had to do with uh, Metro uh, litigation. Uh, so, you know, another $7 million for other items that came up that were outside the original bond scope. You take that out and we're less than 3% over the, the $757 million budget. I'll tell you that in my business, if we only missed by 3%, as a worst case, uh, th that would be pretty good, especially in light of the two year run up we've had in, in cost escalation. So I just wanna put it in perspective that of the $27 million that was, that was foisted upon uh, you know, the, the bond manager and to get that done out of monies that was not originally allocated to the bond, $21 million of additional Veneco remediation that leaves $48 million that we missed on a $757 million project. Again, that's less than 3% in the biggest two-year run-up in escalations in a pandemic with Metro and everything going on. I, I still consider that a success and certainly leads to a perspective of um, this, this ain't broke. The, the, the program is working. Uh, we've got two beautiful buildings to show for it. And there are reasons for why we are where we are. Uh, next slide. Uh, Chad, I'm sorry, can I just ask one quick question? The 69 million, can you just, I, I got the, the 21 million was the legacy wells. What was the 69 million? So there's um, 48, if you go, uh, there's $48 million, sorry, there's $68 million to complete, but there's $20 million of SSMP um, mitigation funds. So that leaves $48 million to complete the projects. 
but there's also the $21 million of legacy wells on top of that, that brings the $48 million cost to complete up to 69 million. Does that make sense? My understanding is that the 21 million is not, um, that's not, that's just to do the oil well, that's not gonna complete all the work that needs to be done. No, that's, that's the portion that has been increased um, from the from the remainder of the the oil well remediation that that Howard touched on earlier, that's not all the work. That's just additional work that came up uh, as we were you know as we were working towards this latter stage of 2021 in, in estimating the final cost to complete. But does so, that include cost for um, for uh, rest restoring the area after it's been done? Uh, Pam, are you? Are you with that because my understanding is that just an ARB time and materials program. Pam, are you uh, are you on to answer questions about this? I the am. I okay. am. I'm kind of trying. Just a second. I mean, there's consulting okay. fees and all the other fees that are associated yeah. with that. Yeah. So, Mrs. Wells, the 21 million is for the legacy wells, not for the Vinico wells. Not for I the Vinico. The Vinico restoration is not included in the 21. It's included in um, the other parts of the budget. So it's I'm talking about the legacy wells. The, the 21 million, my understanding was a quote from ARB. But what about all the other associated consulting costs and, and fees that will go with completing the total project? The $21 million includes a percentage of soft costs. I heard it wasn't close to 30. I mean, originally it was 30, but I mean, yes. I that in addition to ARB's costs, are the quote that you got all the other costs to the district? Yes. So we got an, a quote from ARB and we added soft costs to get to the 21 million. And that's to restore the entire, that area. This is for the legacy wells, yes. Not restoration of the Vinico site. That's I a understand. separate budget. That's, that's included in the 48 million. So it went from 30 million to 21 million? It did. So we actually have good news. Okay. So um, obviously a whole other conversation that could be had about the wells, but um, just um, moving on. Uh, next slide. So I, I had spoken about some of the, the, the expenditures that were outside of the building program, but that still had to come out of the funds. Uh, this is the, you know, almost $28 million dollars. Uh, 20 million alone of which was MTA litigation that um, just to give again some perspective on where we are and, and why we have a, um, you know, why there is a shortfall at this point, you know, $28 million of, of that is, is for money that was outside the scope. So um, just wanted to give some perspective on that background. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, we are now at a place where we have a, a, a much better idea of what it's going to take to finish. Um, we are certainly not experts or here to, uh, to dictate to the board how, how to find the capital. Uh, we do have some ideas, obviously, though this is not the focus of this presentation. Um, next slide. Um, the, on, on August, uh, so before determining what type of financing options work best to fund the completion of the district school construction program, you know, we, we wanted to at least identify some potential revenue sources, and I know the board has already started to consider this. On August 11th, 2020, the board acted and approved the, the appointment of a surplus property, a 7-Eleven advisory committee. On April 19th, 2021, the 7-Eleven committee issued its final report and recommendations. Uh, on May 11th, um, the board of directors um, elected, showed the district office to be surplus property. Um, that same day, uh, we have the request for an RFP process. Um, and one of the things the board considered, which uh, frankly, from my perspective, is a very good one, is to look into entering a long, the long-term ground lease with the developer. That's prime property uh, surrounded by residential um, that could be very accretive to the district you know, through a long-term ground lease without ceding complete control of the property. Um, and then under SB 1413 and AB 3308, uh, you know, certainly encourages residential units uh, to be built on that site. Uh, next, uh, let's see. So um, 
regarding the district office, the 7-Eleven committee, just to get some things out to discuss, recommended that the district declares the, the district office surplus property, enter into a long-term ground lease, um, work, work towards a residential development, such as you know, multifamily, which is you know, surrounding complementary use to the neighborhood. Um, and the reason- uh, yep. yep. Sorry, I'm hearing a lot of feedback. You can go ahead, okay. So the um, anyway, so in in sum, the 7-Eleven committee recommended that the district waive the RFP process, traditional bid process, where the district is obligated to sell to the highest bidder and actually enter into direct negotiations with potential developers uh, to to create revenue for the district. Uh, on May 11th, 2021, the board voted unanimously to waive that and move forward with that process. So the CCAC in short just agrees with the recommendations of that committee and agrees with the board's action to waive that RFP process and proceed with monetizing the value of that site. Uh, you know, unfortunately, given where things are in the state and a, and a recent proposal uh, in, in June of 22, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, a state, state ballot initiative would limit the ability for schools to raise funds. Um, we, we know from when our first bond measure failed, Getting to a district's vote is, you know, incredibly difficult, uh, and so um, Prop 39, the 55 percent threshold, would be eliminated. Obviously, making it very difficult uh, to go forward with with any new bond measures. Um, I, not that a bond measure would be all too popular right now, but it it could get even more difficult uh, should we go down that path. So, uh, next slide. Uh, so, again, whether it's through you know, what the 7-Eleven committee has deemed for excess uh, surplus property grants, working with the city on, on the abatement uh, costs uh, for the wells. Um, there are, you know, multiple sources of revenue that the board can look to. We're not here to say which ones they should be. We're here to just say there are available additional resources, additional funds. We're here to say that the program is working, the buildings are getting completed, and we are getting closer to the end and, and have a very good idea now of, of where things need to be and where they need to be to get completed. So, you know, we do believe, um, next slide, that uh, more, you know, more study sessions is a great start. We appreciate the time. Uh, the more study sessions need to be had. Um, you know, the CCAC notes that the, the board's last instruction study session was in October, 2021. Since that time, the board's appointed a new member. Uh, the CCAC recommends that the board continue to hold a series of construction study sessions to address the issues identified by the CCAC, the CBOC, and the FCC. Uh, um, next slide. If we can move forward and if we can make the tough decisions to move this forward and figure out how to get it done, you know, I do believe that we will have a magnificent high school campus. We'll have a beautiful, I mean, obviously El Rodeo is separate. We'll have a beautiful K-5 new campus. Horace Mann is a relatively new campus. Uh, uh, campus and facilities that, that we can be proud of. If it's not completed, next slide, and you've all seen the pictures, and we're not here for doom and gloom, but we all know what happens if we don't complete. Um, we, we don't get the fields, we don't get the new building C, we're stuck with Conheim, uh, we're stuck with uh, trailers and, and, and bins and dirt and fences, uh, next slide. We all know what the high school looks like. I, I, I don't need to tell all of you, uh, next slide. One thing near and dear to me is, you know, my boys all play baseball and play basketball. And I don't want this to look, my son is in seventh grade. He's going to be in the high school and it won't even be ready, even if all things go well, but maybe for the second half of his high school tenure, I don't want this to be his legacy. I don't want this to be him having to play baseball of a La Siena guy. I want him to be proud of his school. I don't want it to look like this. There won't be fields. There won't be a softball field. Um, they'll be playing makeshift on the football field or at fields, you know, miles away, not on their high school campus. Um, next slide. Obviously there's a lot of dirt to be moved around for, for Venico and the wells. Um, you know, there's a lot of this condition that has to get filled and fixed anyway. Um, if we shut things down, obviously there will be holes in, in, the, in, the, in the process, in the fields, in fencing, there will be, you know, um, I don't wanna spend millions of dollars to put lipstick on the pig. Uh, next slide. Uh, next, yeah, next slide. Obviously we have scaffolding along Olympic. We need to finish all these projects, but I think you all know that. Um, so next slide. So 
where we really are in conclusion is yes, this is Harry Truman. And I think actually this uh, Donna opened up with the buck stops here. Well, it does. And, and the buck stops with this board. Um, you've inherited things from previous boards, some of which they did right, some of which they kicked the can too, too long. Uh, and they couldn't come together to make hard decisions that for 30 years compounded problems that have led to where we are now. But the good news is that we did pass a bond. We did get a bond manager in who's now completed the first two buildings. We doubt we do now know what we need to finish the project. Uh, we do know there's a def deficiency. And so the board does have to figure out how, how to fill that gap. But um, some may think that, that the way to deal with this is to shut things down, put, you know, take the fences down, plant grass on the front lawn, and you know, take a picture in front of the grass and say, look, we, you know, we finished what we did. And now we got these fences down and now, now everything is great. I, I just don't agree. And in my business, we, we finish what we start, we figure out how to get it done. To me, should, should there be third party review to make you comfortable where the costs are? Absolutely. Should you renegotiate com components of the contract that you're not comfortable with? Have that conversation. Uh, but should you solicit feedback from the DSA to figure out what happens if we really do stop this building process? What are the ramifications from that decision? Should you solicit feedback from DLR, our architect, and see what their relationship is with the weather bond manager, what they think about how things are going? Absolutely. Should you solicit feedback from ProWest? I was there originally when we interviewed ProWest and other uh, con construction groups, and, and I think they've done a fine job. And I think you should um, discuss with, with ProWest you know, how things are going and what the relationship is with our bond manager. There's, there's diligence that should be done. I'm not saying to go into this blindly. Uh, but but there's investigations and, and conclusions that you need to come to, I believe, that will, I think, continue to convince you that we're on the right path. So to me, you know, as the, the elected officials, it is your job to make the hard decisions. It is your job to do the tedious work to help make sure that our children get the schools, get the facilities that we promise them that they have that we've come to expect and that our our community should be proud of. The hero in this story to me are those who step up and finish what we started, figure out how to complete the work and get this done. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and I'll uh, see the floor. Thank you very much, Ted. Um, does anyone want to make a quick comment because it's already 5.30? Yeah, I have to go. Yeah, um, have to go. So, has to leave. Can so. I can make a quick sure. comment? So, um, Unfortunately, this was scheduled on Friday night. I have Shabbat, and I've already shared with my board members that I was going to have to leave at 5.30. But I wanted to thank the members of the um, committee, all of you, Howard, Jason, uh, Ted. Thank you for uh, all of the information, for all of the work that you guys have put in. Clearly, you guys are uh, very, one, uh, passionate, and you have a lot of information to share. And I, I do hope we have a follow-up study session because I have, I have loads of uh, questions here to kind of come up to speed. And so we can make a good decision going forward. I will say that I think, I think the whole board, but I'll speak for myself. I mean, everyone shares the concerns about the facilities. I think everyone wants the scope of the work to be uh, completed from my perspective, just in business, I can tell you, I have no doubt there, I mean, there's been a considerable amount of an escalation in all supply chain. There's, there is inflation. I mean, all of this stuff is, is hitting all businesses and our business is no different. So like, I, I definitely believe that all those things exist. I also believe that there have been a number of things that have caught us uh, maybe flat footed to some extent. There's, Sounds like there has been scope creep. There's been things that we did not realize when it came to where the oil wells uh, were and how to uh, remediate them. I mean, like all of that makes sense to me. I really want to dig into a lot of the detail. But with all of that said, my frustration, what I said when I was being interviewed for this board, what I've said time and time again, is that it feels like there's lack of governance and lack of accountability with how this whole process has worked over the years. And I think that even this committee being here tonight and giving us a presentation now after years from what I understand is further like evidence of the fact that we have not had the proper accountability and governance on this construction program. I went back and looked at the deck from like 
I think it was 2018 when this committee was being set up. As Donna said earlier, there were supposed to be five to six members. There were supposed to be terms. There was supposed to be selection by a facilities committee. And we were supposed to be getting quarterly reports as a board at a minimum. And none of that happened. So it's like, it, it, yes, the buck does stop with this board. Yes, I want to see this program done. But I personally, as a board member, am very frustrated that there has been a lack of discussion here, lack of information making its way to this board, what feels like for years. So we need to put in the time. We need to have more study sessions to really come and understand everything that's happened here and make decisions. And I will say that everyone keeps saying that we're doubting this program, or like, or, or, or at least suggesting that we don't want to see this program through. I don't think that's true. But I keep saying time and time again, at least what I'm saying is, I want accountability and I want proper governance over this program. And I think just by the fact that we're having this conversation tonight and all of a sudden all this information is being thrown at us is just, it, it, it's just further showing us that we, we have a problem on our hands. I'm gonna to move to a portable of a device and keep mm -hmm. listening for it as long as I can. Right. But, but again, thank you guys very much for being here tonight and sharing this information. And I hope this is the start of a conversation because there's a lot to unpack in that uh, the presentation that I look forward to doing. Thank, thank you, Dave. Michelle, would you like to comment? Well, I was gonna ask uh, my student board member, Eli, if he would like to say something first. Oh, um, you can go first if you can. Okay. Uh, I just wanna echo everything that my uh, Thanks, board, colleague uh, gave just now. Uh, I know that the members of the CCAC are very passionate about the program and seeing that it comes to conclusion. And I want to thank them for their comprehensive report, but I, I do, uh, I, I for one, worried about this maybe getting done, and I think that we need to have more discussions, and as I said, I really echo the words that uh, Mr. Halimi expressed, and I think we can all agree with, we're all concerned, and we're all very much aware of what's going on. So with that, I'll... Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to, to say a lot of the same is that I agree with a lot of um, what uh, Mrs., Mr. Halimi and Mrs. Marcus have said, just about the general transparency and ensuring that this, that the buck really does stop here, as was said before, and that we are, are getting all the information that we can in a transparent and open manner. Um, and I think that we now have the framework in place to do so. Um, but looking forward to the future having more presentations like this and hopefully seeing a, a more um, inclusive format uh, possibly for the CCAC. Thank you, Eli. Dr. Stern, do you have any comments? Sure. 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 Oh, oh. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for an amazing uh, presentation. Um, I, I like everything, I like the way you communicated it. I thought it was overall pretty easy to understand and to decipher a lot of the numbers and the figures. Um, a couple of small questions that I have. When you talk about the um, the state, the SSMP, so if I, I'm understanding that this is an application for money that can be possibly um, given to the school district. Is that is that what that mm -hmm. means? Yes. So that's money that we could potentially receive um, towards this shortfall. Yeah, the trustee, uh, Dr. Stern, it's the same process that we had. Those funds are available. It's the same process where we got funding from the state for this program with Horace Mann, with B1, B2. B3, B4, we were approved so we can, we, the company can book that money that's coming in. And as soon as the application goes in on El Rodeo, those funds, to some degree, whether it's, whether it's 20 million, maybe a little less, maybe a little bit more, they negotiate it once the application's in and approved, just like they're doing with B3, B4. It's a state program that's been running for a couple of years now. And we have received money from uh, the state on that for the other projects. And then the other thought I had is looking at the other revenue and financing options. I mean, you know, these are possible, but they're, they're vague and it, it would be, you know, obviously a lot of oversight and a lot of manpower to, to get a lot of these to work. And it, it's sort of, it's disappointing that, you know, for many, many reasons, which are perhaps out of our control, but the pandemic and, and, and the shortfall that has happened, but 
you know, a lot of these suggestions seem like they are pretty vague and they'd have to be really be developed, I think, to be serious, viable options. And Dr. Stern, and that's a good point. And uh, your CBO as an individual is aware of an individual that is actually on retainer with the district, who's an expert in public-private development projects. He was, it was looked at when the 7-Eleven committee was being formatted and whatever recommendations that they were gonna make. And he actually had, they have a presentation that he gives to school districts that talk specifically about this type of funding. So that may be something that uh, Dr. Bragg or the board may want to inquire with the CBO about with Mr. Roach. Okay, and then another thought I have, another theme is that, I mean, I, I'm aware that there's obviously an intersection between construction and modernization and security and security equipment and security um, surveillance and those types of things. And I haven't heard anything about that or any status or, or you know, concern for that. And, and as a parent, as a, as a board member too, I remain very concerned about the, the funds that we use to apply for that, towards that on, in terms of construction and you know, do you have any comments on that? And, and yes. money outlaid that, and where what has been developed given those? Yes, Dr. Stern, the security was beyond the scope of the CCAC. We don't have the expertise in security. We never professed to. Um, at the time the CCA was uh, CCAC was created, there was a security steering committee, and then the district hired a company uh, to monitor or oversee security. You also had. Um, a gentleman by the name of Scott Lovelace, which was your security uh, person. So that aspect we did not look into because the district had other avenues and other expertise, people with expertise dealing with security. So that was beyond the scope of this committee. Thank you. Now we have any comments? Um, yeah, just quickly. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for the presentation. Um, I, I think I, I keep on hearing the word Transparency, um, that's the buzzword. Transparency, accountability, transparency. And my question for everybody who brings that term is, what do you feel is not being transparent? All of the contracts that we support for the program, we vote on in public, they're posted contracts. Um, all of the accounting, um, we understand that uh, the bond management program has an open door policy. We request things, we can get uh, any information. So what I'm, what I'm curious is at this time, when, when I've, I've heard three of my colleagues say the word transparency is, a, is an issue for them and that um, they tried to, um, a public comment tried to uh, shed doubt on the viability of the committee, um, doesn't seem appropriate. Uh, the committee had no obligation to report to us on any particular schedule, but now that B1 and B2 is finished, and now that they were able to finally verify through a third party the final numbers, that information is ready to come in front of us. Um, I, I just, I wish people would be, we would be more transparent when we say we want more transparency, because if there's something that we aren't getting, we should specifically ask for it. And with an uh, over $750 million bond program, we can ask as a board for anything. We're allowed to ask for anything. And I don't like, and I've dealt with this for years, when on any subject, not just construction, when people throw out the term, we need more accountability and transparency. No, I think what we need to do as a board is come together for the right things and you ask the right questions and get the right answers so we can make the right decisions. Um, we're starting to do that tonight, and hopefully we'll continue, like Gabe said, hopefully we'll continue this conversation. But I don't feel like I'm ever getting duped. I don't feel like I'm fooling the community. I don't feel that that's ever the case. I feel what it is is, in all honesty, there's a lot to unpack here. And, it's, and to truly understand every component of everything that was discussed tonight would take days. It would take days for us to, for us to either relate that to the community or even individually understand these components. So it's really important for us to arm ourselves with as much information as possible before we make further decisions about the program, how we're gonna finish, how we're gonna get, how we're gonna get funding. Um, uh, these are all big question marks. Dr. Stern brought it up. And I think that addressing this with, with our CBO and with our finance committee and giving direction and keeping it all under committees that can now address things 
that are accountable, that are transparent, that do post minutes, that do publicize their meetings. Um, it can have a community involvement in finding the solutions to the issues that were brought up tonight. But the one thing I, I did not hear tonight is that the actual program being the problem. The program is not the problem. If all of these other things are the problem, then at least we should address the actual problems and not create a problem out of something that is not. So um, thank you gentlemen for that. And I look forward to moving forward with this program to the best of our financial ability. Um, well, I'd like to thank you all for being here this evening. Thank you for taking the time to put together this presentation. Um, I, I definitely believe that you're all very passionate about the program and the projects that we have. Um, I agree with my colleagues on, on many points and on some I, I, I disagree. I think that, well, first of all, in terms of agreeing, I would say that I believe that all of us on this board wanna see these projects completed and wanna see our schools to be finished. And that is all of our goal. I, I, I feel comfortable saying that that's what we want and nobody intends to stop this program or in any way leave the, pro the schools in the state that they're in. I think the bigger question that we have is, you know, reviewing where we are at at this point and seeing why we are in the state that we are in. Um, I think it's about uh, not a question of whether we want to do these projects. It's a question of reviewing how our program management has been. And, uh, you know, from where I stand, we, we're $129 million short. You can say we're a different number, but if you want to go into transparency, there's a lot of different numbers and how you want to present them, they can look different. Uh, but we know we're short and we didn't find out that we were short until recently. And to me, that is uh, an area that could have huge improvement. We should be having better reporting uh, along the way instead of hearing about this at this stage in the game that now we're short. I, I think that um, from a management standpoint, having that transparency in our reporting and understanding where we are and when so that we can start addressing these issues earlier on. Uh, I don't think that we are on time and I don't think that we're on budget. And that's you know, really where I stand. It's about reviewing where, where we are and how we got here and how do we make that better. Not a question of whether we want to finish our school projects or our construction programs and we want to see completed schools because I 100% want to see that. And I appreciate you um, bringing forth some of the other ideas that we've had come to us from the 7-Eleven committee as well as other ideas for financing because I think it's really important for us to be creative and to look at the many different resources that we can, that we can access and ways to complete the program. And I, I really believe strongly that we all have that commitment. When I, when I look at accountability and transparency to Noah's point, for example, I, I just don't think that we see everything in one, in, in the big picture. So when we talk about projects that got added, you're not talking about projects that got deleted. There was, you know, in the original bond project, uh, in the original bond proposal, the projects that were identified included a parking structure at the high school for, I think it was, eight, I want to say 85 million, but I may be misspeaking on the, the number. There was an elevated parking structure with a playground uh, at El Rodeo that's been eliminated. There were dollars that were earmarked for Hawthorne that's been eliminated. So as well as things being added on, there, there's been some very big ticket items that have been eliminated and we're short. So I think we have to look at it in the whole picture instead of looking at it piecemeal. And I think that's a more honest conversation and a more transparent conversation about where we are on our bond program. I think that you know the fact that the oil wells went from 30 million to today, now they're 21 million, it's speculative for in both instances. So I, I just don't think we can speak in absolutes. I think we have to consider um, many of the other costs. We don't talk about all the other consulting fees and soft costs that went into B1 and B2. We talk about the ProWest contract and the guaranteed max price. But I'm curious to know what is the what was the budget for B1 and B2 all in with all the consulting fees and all the other fees that went to the district that we funded with the bonds that were part of B1 and B2. That's not part of the ProWest contract. So yes, the ProWest guaranteed max price was on time and under budget. I believe I'd, I'd have to check on the timing, but clearly it was under budget and there was enough contingency in there to refund 
four and a half million dollars to Pro West. So that even though we've had escalation and we've had COVID, we were able to have four and a half, nine million left in contingency on that contract. So I, I think there's a lot to look at and that we should all use our resources. I really appreciate having people in the community like yourselves that are willing to volunteer their time and their expertise so that we can have the best schools possible and that we can complete this construction program. I think our common ground is that's what we all wanna see. And we wanna see it done as fast as possible uh, and having the dollar that we can find accessible for us to do so and, and doing so in an efficient way. So um, I just would say again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for putting this presentation together. And I'm gonna pass this on to Dr. Brady. Thank you. And I want to thank Mr. Goldstein, uh, Mr. Fenton, Mr. Run uh, for being part of the committee. Um, I have shared with the board um, the, uh, some clarification about the committee. Um, this was a, a, a committee that uh, Mr. Blake used in a former district. And when he came to our district, he shared this with us. It was intriguing about using community partnerships. Uh, a draft uh, of the committee makeup and responsibilities, a draft presentation was made um, in May of of 2018, um, and uh, that was a draft presentation that was made to the board. Um, and uh, that committee was put together, and uh, we met several times. It was a very uh, helpful committee uh, to me along the way. Um, the uh, reporting piece, uh, the officer piece, um, those types of things, um, that, that was never presented to the people that were applying for the committee. That was all in that draft form. So. Um, I wanted to share that information with all of you. Um, and the, the committee has been meeting. There hasn't been information to share to the board, uh, but it has been an active committee. And uh, I also appreciate this opportunity for uh, this committee to share information with the board tonight. So thank you. Can I, say, right. can I say one more thing before the committee is dismissed? Sure. Thank you. Um, I think, um, Howard, your, your team had a third party validate some numbers. And I think uh, President Wells is, is operating on, uh, you know, there's a difference of $60 million between the number um, she presented and the number you guys presented. Um, I, I think at, at some point we're gonna need um, to either validation either through the finance committee or somebody to give us a number to work with. Um, so uh, I, I don't, uh, I, I think, and I know that, that Pam Johnson is on. I don't know if she can actually address this. Uh, I know she deals with both Wade and our finances. So I'd like to understand from, from because you presented a number from the CAC, but if I can maybe hear from Pam or we can try to get, we, we need a springboard, right? We need a point to start it with so we can, you know, be having a shortfall of 129 million is much different than having a shortfall of 69 million. So I think that's gonna help us move forward. Um, go, go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, so both numbers are correct. The 129 million is worst case scenario if you bid the projects in 2024. The CCAC's numbers are presuming that you go up, that you go ahead right now. So the difference is escalation. Thank you for the clarification. I have another question money. about the security. I mean, I know that um, like the numbers that you presented on this presentation say 5.7 million and I, you know, by my rough estimate, we're over 10 on security. So I think that, you know, all of these numbers, we kind of need to look at in a more, in a more global way of where bond dollars have gone. Okay, um, that's, that would be um, difficult to go from five, seven to 10 because what you have are the numbers from the inception of the program that have been tabulated by um, a third party. And, a, and all of their information comes from what is entered into the district's database. So the budget number that we gave you, the um, 5.7 million comes right from the district's database. Well, I'm, I'm just looking at the warrants that have been on our agendas. But I think we should, to my point, I think we should follow up on this and 
have more clarity. And I, I might add, you had mentioned before um, a question. Your question was, what was the original budget uh, for B1, B2? <clears throat> And a 2018 budget all in was 79 million 50,000. And it actually came in at 74 million and changed because of the savings that was returned to the district. Do you have any more questions? No. Anyone else? Okay, um, Howard and Ted and Jason, thank you so much for your presentation. And we are gonna move on to the next item on our agenda. Okay, well, uh, nice, nice speaking with you all and we're, we're here to help. So hopefully, as I think someone mentioned earlier, this is the start of many conversations to get to the, the right answer. Thanks so much. Take care. Good night. Okay. Uh, next item on our agenda is I'm crossing my agenda, but I want to say it's 9B, right? 8B construction update. So Don Blake and Pam Johnson. Good job. I want to ask a question here of the participants. I know this has gone probably a little later than we had scheduled. Um, we have a uh, slide presentation, a number of slides that are here regarding updates, which are the typical update that we would do normally at a board meeting. Plus, we have material that has to do with addressing uh, budget information and cash flow information and backup information that's supplied to otherwise to the committees. I could go through that, but in the interest of time, um, I do have some material, Dr. Bregge, if you could put that up for me. These are some, what I'd like also presenting here in terms of update, if the, the review, uh, unless you would like me to go through the slides with you uh, or go through the, if you have questions from the budget material and accounting material that Pam provides, happy to do that. But I think in the interest of time, I'd like to go through with you some things that I think the board needs to be aware going forward in your decision-making about program, about how the program has been delivered. I get the point that there's some concern or there's some um, suspicion, I would even say, regarding this program or how it's delivered or how we do it. So what I'd like to do, because you need to make those decisions about the program and how you want it delivered, and you need, to, and I know you'll be making decisions about who you're going to use to have it delivered. So going forward, lots of decisions and direction. You have some decisions to make about uh, the program delivery, how you might want to have it delivered differently, but more importantly, who is going to deliver it for you? That's ahead of you. So what I want to do, I have Dr. Bregge, if you could put that up. Yes, and if you could just clarify uh, which information uh, is it? Uh, I have it, Dr. Oh, okay. Um, March 4th. Um, has it's, just... it's the last slide, material for the last slide. There you go. It's just... So this is mostly for the entire board and each of these bullet points can certainly be items that we can come back and provide more detail for if you'd like. But this is a, this is a high altitude. Most of the things that you see here are the things that we otherwise do on a daily basis. Uh, our firm, combination of our firm, combination of, as it were, uh, general counsel, and you'll see an asterisk on each of these line items, what that means is that's an item that would require legal counsel. So this information I'm going to go through fairly quickly, but I want to get to the piece on B3, B4 and give you an, some clarity and understanding 
of what actually goes on in the building portion of this program. I know that's not what you were talking about tonight, but I wanna at least bring you up to speed on that. So first we'll start with, these are topics, these are direction that you will have in front of you to consider as you consider going forward. Reconciliation of the MTA oil well reimbursement is about $500,000 there that our team and um, uh, the previous um, our law firm were managing and mitigating on behalf of the district. There's about $500,000 there that you'll need to make decisions about direction to go forward with. There's some decisions. <clears throat> Next one is important. Our issues regarding monitoring. There's various layers and complications regarding monitoring because what I'm going to be showing you about some other points is 80 years ago, a decision was made to build this uh, school campus on an oil field. And the consequence of making that choice to build them on an oil field is there'll be some monitoring for various components that will go on forever because the soil and the soil conditions have methane mitigation and monitoring requirements. So you make some decisions about some methane mitigation issues going forward, um, depending on what decisions you make, you'll need to consider that. I would recommend that as you think those things through that that piece will be part of your decision-making. Imminent domain lawsuit, uh, replace the PMK. That would be um, a decision or some direction you'll need to make. A uh, big one here uh, wrapped into that component is clear title regarding LAUSD's claim to ownership. Uh, you do not have clear title. And there, uh, when we talk about the utilities, we also do not have clear title on portions of uh, Heathrow that will need to be continued direction and decision. Some of that will be legal and some will be how, how you would like and to whom you would like that work to be done. Resolve the DTSC site permit at the high school. This is a big one. This is something that has been in play at least the almost five years that I've been here. We're getting close to that conclusion that will be done when the final design for the site will be completed. This is an important one. Pay the critical consultants, consultants timely. For the last two years, that has not been the experience, and I highly recommend that that piece be attended to and change. DSA inspector staffing, that's a big one currently. Um, so you know where we are, some board knows where we are in your decisions going forward. On the DSA inspectors, Mike Barbera is currently the inspector, it's called inspector of record for DSA. He's the on-site full-time inspector. An understanding, I'm not, and I understand that the board is not familiar with um, how things work at DSA, but this is a piece of information I'd like, I'd like you to be aware of going forward so you're informed. Because of who Mike Barbera is and my reputation with DSA, we have one DSA inspector for both Elodale and the high school. That is highly unusual, very unusual. Generally speaking, Mike Barbera is responsible for what's called semi-monthly reports at DSA. There are six. Typically, you would have six inspectors. You have one. And one assistant who is also certified DSA inspector. Currently, basically, the idea, what does it mean to you? Your daily cost is about $2,500 for one DSA inspector and one assistant. The staff going forward, if you choose whatever delivery method you want to choose, then you will need minimum of six DSA inspectors. The one who makes the final decision about who is that person, who gives the confidence of that person, is the architect of record and the structural engineer. They sign off on who that who they feel they want that DSA inspector to be the inspector of record. Here's the difference. You're currently spending about 2,500 a day for DSA inspection. 
if there's a change, we do something different, then you'll be providing more than just one DSA inspector. That cost will be $15,200 a day for DSA inspections to change. I would like you to know that and be part of your decision making. I Right now, DSA inspector is a huge pre premium. Okay, so maintain Procore. That's important. The Procore is an automated database. And when, um, at least it was my decision, you can decide how you want to do it. But my decision was to use Procore and have the district own the license and pay for the license. I know there's been some concerns and questions along the way about cost and about uh, value. And uh, I recommend that uh, the district always own the database. The database, I mean, all the database, all emails, all transmittals, all RFIs, everything relating to the project in its entirety, that the district own that database. The last uh, program manager who left, left with the license in all of the database. So it's important decision to make. Um, next important one here is to maintain the document management system we use currently. We, we have someone that the district pays um, that we do scanning and copying of all hard documents. That would be drawings, correspondence, invoices, all documents relating to the entire program is copied and put in a file system on the F drive, F drive with the district of which the district owns. That's currently about five terabytes of documentation. That's been put in, we went as far back as we could with documents and we are current and we do this on a daily basis. So your file system is current. Um, on the program side, what, what I'm not presenting here would be something Pam Johnson would be also suggesting to, we could do that in a separate meeting. This is specifically project-based information that I want to present to you for your consideration for direction. Okay, the Venico site. What's important on here is to finish the water leak cleanup. We're about 90% complete at the moment. We have an insurance claim that needs to be resolved that will require uh, legal attention. Um, it's important to understand about the Venico site is in order to finish it, you'll need to decide or give direction for how you want to build the retaining wall that's been approved by DSA, it's called retaining wall number five. You'll need to put that retaining wall in, in order to put the dirt on eight feet of dirt on top of the Venico site, which would be necessary to get your approval from both um, uh, CalGEM for the, for the 19 wells and DSA, uh, excuse me, DTSC, for what's called the wrap, which is the um, com completed permit for that for that scope of work. Um, complete uh, the wrap that's uh, in a band, uh, determine and make a decision about abandoning the legacy wells. So can, can we go up further, please? Move the document Don, up. Don, for the, yes. uh, for the decision about the retaining wall mm -hmm. and uh, Aren't we waiting for the design drawings for that to come back before we are able to move forward on on that part? No, no. You have a, a you, the the retaining wall is approved from DSA. But I thought we couldn't do that work until we have the design drawings from out of DLR. That's for the site work, not the retaining wall. Right, but it's related to the site work. But the, you, they're separate projects, so you can do the retaining wall. It's possible the reason why we, if you will, segmented the retaining walls into four separate A numbers to go to DSA was to give you the flexibility to be able to do the retaining wall just for Venico, which wraps around um, Olympic and comes up a portion of the Heath Road. The rest of those have to do with if you want to go forward with the with the grading or mass grading, you have that flexibility. But what I'm saying is that uh, the retaining wall for um, what we call retaining wall number five has been approved at DSA. We're completing the demo uh, or the repair from the uh, water damage 
and moved out all the equipment and it will be basically an eight foot hole for that whole area and you'll need to make a, a decision how what direction you want to go with uh, that retaining wall so if we could move up a little we could you know, go to arrow jail and want to go try to go as quickly through this to give you a feel this is this is so you see it you hear from me and then these would my my recommendation would be this for the beginning of questions or detailing or backup okay arrow down DTSC or oversight and perpetuity. There's some. There's a, something that has to do with design choices and decisions uh, surrounding. There is an oil well on the property, not a water well. There's an oil well. HMC true up. Okay, what that means is this: some direction. What will happen is the contracts for both HMC and for DLR are based on a percentage of completed costs. So what we mean by true up is that as we go through cost analysis, when you get to the end of uh, the project, then you will do, there'll be a, a true up for HMC. Resolve the scope for furniture, order and install. That one uh, is being currently uh, managed by um, uh, Kathleen Moore. And I think there's still, there will be some decisions and direction about that selection and that process. We need to resolve water, sewer, landscaping issues with the city. May, I think that can be done in the auspices of uh, what um, Griselda is able to accomplish in bridging between the design and the city requirements and successfully completing those hookups. Um, complete the SSMP, which is state seismic mitigation program that we talked about earlier. Resolve exterior fence design. That's one piece that is still in the process of decision-making. And that one, some direction will need to be addressed. And then finally, con conduct a construction audit at completion. Can I go up further? go to the high school okay the next what i'm what we're presenting here are projects that are under construction or the board has already approved that's what this uh, information is intended for okay for the underground utility modernization resolve the easements and owner with the city an ownership with the city public works uh, which will require legal counsel we are still the easements entitlements have been um, varying levels of uh, assumptions and incompleted information. Uh, we have the SOMAS as the civil engineer and we go through Chicago title and it's taken us uh, a couple of months to get Chicago title to actually give us that information or follow that trail. So that will still need to be resolved conduct the construction audit. Okay, on the south side, modernization. South, the south side, what we call south side, really includes the, we say south side, but what it means is the, everything but uh, the buildings itself, everything that's outside of the buildings, which would be the um, graduation lawn and the play fields and the retaining walls, um, com components. So that's what we have here. Methane mitigation design approval. Um, that's uh, a design process that will end up in agreeing and negotiating uh, with uh, DTSC to determine what that level of mitigation is going to be. Exterior fence final design. Um, a complete ADA path of travel uh, in order for the board to have design immunity on this particular issue. It's accomplished by the fact that we are completing the designs that complete that path of travel. That's why you're doing the uh, completed design for the site work. Okay, resolve Board of Education design immunity regarding Conheim. This is a very important piece on this. Um, the intended design as far as DSA is concerned was to demo the Conheim. 
if you choose not to demo the Kahnheim, and that's a decision that's important piece of direction, I highly recommend that you achieve or you obtain legal counsel on that matter regarding your design immunity. Building C, DSA approved, retaining wall two uh, approved, uh, retaining wall three, that's kind of this information and the Vanek Powell. So this has to do with the south side. Can I go up a little bit? I'm gonna save most of my communication for the last one. Okay, buildings one and two, complete where we are. Um, is we need to complete, there's a final closeout, which is called certification that has to do with some final documentations. That's a, an administrative and, and routine. However, direction and integra integration with your MO department is we generally are involved in supporting MO with during the warranty period and uh, commissioning period. So it's not just closing it out from the contract standpoint or DSA standpoint, but making sure that the warranty period and the turnover period and the commissioning period is coordinated with MO. There'll be a, a deal. DLR true up on B1, B2. One thing that was talked about, um, it didn't get on the schedule, is scheduling a grand opening for B1, B2. That's a direction or a choice. Okay, now I'm going to get to B3, B4. Um, negotiate the final PGMP, legal counsel to prepare documents, direction, and um, communicate whatever the board's direction is for that one. I recommend that the final de uh, development of the documents as we've gone through this entire project um, has gone through legal counsel for final. There's a DLR true up, initiate an ff &E, which would be the furniture, fixtures, and equipment scope and order and install. Okay, go, please go up to the next one. Next page. And I think that's the last page. So this one, upon completion, activate methane monitoring and construction audit. These are very general uh, issues that are not just necessarily routine, but uh, you'll need to provide decisions and direction. Now, this particular piece has to do with understanding some information about um, how these projects have been put together. And I understand, um, I, I've heard a lot of things in public and I heard a lot of things in newspapers about the project costing too much money and taking too long. Um, I, I would hope that someone would have the acumen and the standing to look at the drawings and look at these projects and take a minute to understand Anyone that's in the business professionally it would understand what's in front of you. An RFI is some, it's it's for those I don't mean to be assuming you don't know, but RFI is a request for information. In the in the when you're building a building, especially a DSA project, an RFI gets written when the work the subcontractor the contractors are going into an area we're approaching something that says this isn't on the drawing or this isn't clear on the drawings how to do this or something there's a gap here in the in the construction documents so they write an rfi also within a dsa project something occurs it's called a ccd okay that's a construction change document within the dsa world that's the same as when you submitted the drawings to DSA and they went through the DSA process and they approved it, a CCD is important to understand because when you on an RFI, they're asking a question and then you try to get the answer, that RFI can turn into what's called a CCD. What's really important to understand about a CCD is that you stop back away from that work, stop. And you, you let's say we, in the cases of B1, B2, when you take off all the plaster on the existing, um, existing concrete and you find it's utterly decayed, 
and there are areas where the concrete actually falls apart and it's just exposing the rebar. And you look at that and you say, well, how do we fix this? Well, the fix has to go from the dirt, right? From all the way down to the dirt, to the footing, to the wall, and all the way to the roof. So that means a structural engineer has to then take a drawing, plot a solution, do the actual calculations in order to solve that problem. That goes to DSA, and DSA treats it, it goes into a bin, and the, the plan checkers plan check them, just like a set of drawings, and that information comes back. Typically, an RFI, it's just the RFI, they ask a question, the information is returned in 15 days. However, if it has to turn into a DSA, the structural engineer and the architect says, we need to do a drawing to go to DSA. Some of these RFIs were at DSA for six months or were in design for six months. And revisions were made. So you see addenda revisions. To, we had 360 CCDs. Been doing this um, a few years. The most I've ever had on a complicated project of a CCD was two. This is extraordinary projects. What it indicates is that the seismic retrofit is dependent upon information that were taken from um, drawings that were, we call them azimuths, from the 1920s. That was the source documents. So you have to destroy or demolish or take off all the interior back to, the, to just the bare concrete or the bare block at the exterior and then work through how you're going to solve it based on discovery. So what does all that mean? Well, El Rodeo is about 50% complete. And we're currently at over 1,200 RFIs. The most I've ever had on, on a project of these matters. I've done high rises and major projects in terms of cost, but in certain complexity maybe 500 RFIs. So the RFIs mean we can't figure out how to build it. So then DSA says, okay, you have to prove to us your engineering, re-engineer it so we know, so we can approve it. What that means is you have to find a way to get a momentum in production. So it's a production impact. Let me move down on B3, B4. Let's look at B3, B4, which is about 50% complete. On B1, B2, 1,700 RFIs, 238 CCDs. Every CCD has a minimum time delay, time, not delay, but time impact. A CCD will have at least 90 days to 120 days. We've had some that have almost nine months to go through the system, come back, get revised, and be able to build and create a momentum. We're talking about mostly the structural. So what we've had in these projects so far is 674 CCDs. Um, we've, none of us have experienced this. Doug Humphrey would tell you he hasn't experienced this in terms of the complexity of a seismic retrofit in a decayed building and what the concept is. So RFIs, 4,000 RFIs. We're used to a couple hundred, maybe 500. Total revisions, these are revisions to those RFIs and revisions to the drawings. 476 actual drawing revisions. Um, addenda revisions. That means the whole, the, the, the DSA says, you have too many CCDs. We want a drawing, revise the drawing. We've had 14 revised sets of drawings between the two campuses. So what does all that mean? Well, one of the things that we plan for, a lot of it we plan for, and a lot of it we identified, um, 
and we uh, example would be and before uh, before there's a corner a south a, um, a southwest corner about 25 percent of that four space when we started to dig down and um, remove some of the uh, material for ha hazmat we found that that corner of the building was built on what's called slush i mean the building was built it wasn't it, when say engineered it's usually compacted it's uh, up to a certain standard we call that an engineered fill but a quarter of that whole building which tied into the tower was built on material or organic material it wasn't compacted and you don't discover that until you pull off and you look at it well the consequence of that one in particular we had to dig down 20 feet below the bottom of the footing sure because we can only that that's a big wall to shore that had to be shored then we had to shore the footing and the wall all the way to the roof because once you uncover the soil, you, you're trying to hold this building together. So we went down 20 feet to find what's called um, native or, or find a competent soil where we could get enough compaction. So then you put all that back. That happened throughout B3, B4, a um, hundred times where we dug down and found out the footings weren't as deep where we found contaminated soil. B1, B2 wasn't as bad in that regard for some reason, but B1, B2 had 260 micropiles. I think you all have seen the picture. We had to put the micropiles in to hold the building from, from moving. We didn't have to do that in B3, B4. What we did encounter was in, in, a, um, in areas like in the, where the um, auditorium is. And the drawings assumed there might be some hazmat, which we went in and we did some testing and we found out the hazmat and then we did the destructive work and we found out that everything under the, uh, where the uh, teeth go, it was supposed to be concrete piles that hold up the concrete, it was bricks. So all that we had to pull it out. So we pull all that out. And the next thing we discover is that the dirt is what we call hot because we test, right? Because everything on the high school is on a DTSC site, which means we have to test every bucket of dirt that comes out, every bucket of dirt that comes out of the building and goes into a dumpster or goes into a truck has to be determined what level of contaminant and where does it go. So the newest thing that happened in this last week is we dig, dig in the corridor, uh, the corridor that runs down to the to the um, auditorium, and we've been running on that for you know gosh uh, almost two years, but it's time to take the dirt out and begin to do the work, and so we discovered there's some material that is uh, um, is very uh, means we have to take it out and it can't be compacted because it's called liquefaction it's it's it, it can't be compacted so we say well how deep is this we go out with the excavator we try to find how deep is it the entire corridor that means we'll be digging down in that corridor i'm hoping that we can do a little bit at a time and find out and not have to take out the, all the dirt in that quarter. All the dirt in that quarter is about 800 cubic yards. 800 cubic yards. Um, we have to take it out and bring in fill, right? That all comes out and we bring in fill. We might be able to mix some on site, but I don't think so. So that is what we run into and that's what we try to use all the contingencies for, but there comes a point where the conditions and the unknowns, um, it's, it's just, there comes a point where we can't anticipate. We have on B1, B2, before we started, 10,000, about 10,500 line items 
that my team did and the Pro West team did when the drawings came out of DSA. 10,500 line items, what we call gap analysis. The drawings that came out of DSA was not enough information to be able to bid in what we anticipated that would be RFIs or CCDs. So a lot of them we anticipated. And we used, um, that was our risk management and our claims management approach. B1, B2 is very successful in that. I've heard it said, which I find inaccurate, that ProWest got a bonus for the project. I think that's pejorative. I think the issue was both the district was incentivized as well as ProWest incentivized to do the work of identifying what the risk is, quantify that. And as we go through and mitigate the project, we're able to work through problems that we thought were going to be there either from schedule or from actual delays or, or uh, additional work based on unknowns. B3, B4 is not the same kind of building and El Rodeo is not the same kind of building. So as you go forward and you think about um, your program and how you want it delivered or don't want it delivered or to deliver methodology. Um, I wanted to give you at least a starting point of what you should be thinking about when it's time to give direction on these components. So, any questions? Eli, would you like to start? Um, Sure. Uh, I'm still here, but my computer died, so that's why I'm not on the camera. Um, would you be able to scroll up? I just had a couple of like clarifying questions on some acronyms. So we'll like okay. uh, a little. Oh, there we go. Uh, I was curious what PMK standed for. Person for most knowledgeable. Okay. What do you think? Person, Person most knowledgeable. knowledgeable. That's what I thought it was. <clears throat> Scroll down if it's right. request for information. Request for information. Yeah. Um, oh, there. Um, what is uh, HMC? What's the architect's firm? Oh, sorry. Okay. That, that's the name of the architect. That's the firm's uh, ac the firm's in, uh, acronym. Like DLR is the architect at the high school. HMC is the architect at Illardale. Thank you. Uh, scroll down a little bit, please. No CCD there. CCD. Change the structure. There are CCDs. FFDs. I think that's about it for me. Thank you for the um, presentation. Michelle? Well, it was very, very uh, uh, complete as to what we are where we are and where we have to go and so on. Um, one of the things that it seems to me that one of the things that has caused a great deal that you mentioned is a lot of the obstacles that you ran into uh, that you evidently didn't anticipate in the construction process, which has delayed uh, and probably increased the cost of the construction as going forward. Um, and, and also, how would you rate that in the place where we're at right now, Mr. Blake? How would you rate that where we are right now as to um, the, the, the problems that you ran into, the delays and the extra costs that that caused you to incur uh, going into the project? A would be two, the delays and the, um, as I described, all of the CCDs, that, that delay process, we were able to find ways in B1, B2, because we're able to work on multiple floors. So most of the problem was in the first floor. As you recall, we went through those um, tours. Most of the, all of that structural concrete uh, seismic retrofit was for B1, B2 was in the floor and all those micro piles. And so at B1, B2, we're able to work on the second floor in the roof area 
and continue to keep crews working, we're able to establish a momentum. B3, B4, we don't have that option in terms of space to flip through. Um, and the reason why B3, B4, I, I know that, uh, let, me, let me make this crystal clear. I've repeatedly said the reasons why I didn't want to do a, um, I would not bring to you a bond update until October was in fact to verify what we were seeing that was alarming. The market, we have bids, uh, market prices on uh, building C, three bids, market prices from subcontractors on site work. We were able to get a successful bid from ARB for the oil wells, for example. I wanted to know that we actually had market prices to confirm that the escalation had gone beyond anything any of us had imagined. So that's why I didn't do it in June. I did it. We had pricing completing in July. And when we finally had those prices, as I said repeatedly, when I'm able to confirm something to you that is concrete and verifiable, then I would bring it. On B3, B4, if you look at this last page here, you look at down at the B3, B4. We're halfway through B3, B4. There are, um, uh, uh, let's go down the bottom. The problem with victory before is how many CCDs ended up on both those, both those and we're only 50% complete. Those CCDs, we were able to put in, I'm gonna use an acronym, a ROM, it's called the rough order of magnitude. When the CCD comes in, we see, oh my gosh, what is this? We put a budget on it, but we know that we're not gonna get the approved drawings back from DSA for maybe six months or nine months because they're structural. When they come back, then we have the subcontractor's price and now I have a price. The ROMs tended to be much higher, much, much higher than what the actual prices were when we finally got the completed CCDs. So it's been frustrating for this project. Uh, it isn't that someone is uh, not attending to it, is that in, we want to get to you actual bid prices, verified prices, not budgets and not rough order of magnitude. Um, realizing the way this program was, let's say they did a rough order of magnitude. You could say, well, this is open book accounting, Don. At the end of the job, it's cost plus a fee. So let's say the, the rough estimates were, were over or whatever they were. At the end of the day, it's cost plus a fee. So B3, B4 has been the most difficult challenge out of all of the projects that we have attempted mostly because of the condition of the building and the solution and the approach to do the seismic retrofit, we are putting steel in and we're putting concrete in to hold the building together. And when we get halfway through and we discover something in the tower, for example, that whole roof had to come off. I know you've seen it. I know Noah, you reminded me during the rainy seasons that the roof is completely gone. Well, that was not in the drawings. That was not in the design. The interior inside of that whole thing, all of the steel, all the girders, all of the columns had to be completely redesigned and redone because we found out in the dirt and we found out in the footings, the concrete footings supporting those walls were not what was on the drawings. So I would say, uh, Ms. Marcus, that at El Rodeo, we're confident with the schedule and we're confident with the GMAX. Uh, we're absolutely confident with El Rodeo. B1, B2, we were able to deliver it and be able to say, well, we didn't need all this contingency for this risk management. B3, B4 schedule is going to be a challenge. And the final price, we're, we feel, I'm meeting with the, um, uh, Pro West on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, and we think we have all the final prices. So, to answer your question, how do we, does it cost more money? Um, we're able to identify the actual cost. We're able to identify that 
the cost that the district is paying is not a cost plus a change order. It's the, the cost that is in the guaranteed maximum price. It's a real challenge to make that work, but schedule, I'm not concerned about. And the costs for El Rodale, I'm not concerned about, or the costs for the underground. The underground, we believe we have enough contingency in it to look out for some things because digging in the soil at Beverly Hills High School means you dig with an excavator, a big pile of dirt, you have to test it and decide if you can reuse it or keep going. Almost each bucket that, that, that we pull out of the dirt, we have to test and determine if we can put it back. So, uh, I don't know if I answered your question about Ms. Marcus. Well, I, I, you know, I hear so much about the fact that the addition to the, the inflation of 20% uh, that has caused so much of this problem. I, I don't think that that's uh, sometimes fair to put it all on that because I also see the obstacles that the request for information, the CCDs and the, you know, and what you have have also caused uh, a great deal of changes in the uh, budgets and in the uh, pre pre predicted the, the, the costs would be. I have one last question. And but don't to, let, me, let me clarify that, Ms. Marcus, we have a misunderstanding. The RFIs and the CCDs doesn't change the cost to the district. <laughs> the, the escalation has to do with the market costs. We had budgets that were developed in 2018 with an assumption of a certain amount of escalation. The escalation from 2000, 2018 to October of 2021 was an additional 21% that none of us could have anticipated. And if you're going to bid the work going forward right now, that escalation is going straight up. It's not plateauing, it's going straight up. So I need to tell you and inform you that the market is not supporting our budgets because of escalation, not because the scope missed or schedule or it, it, we didn't anticipate the right time or the right amount of, of uh, scope in these projects. It has to do with the escalation for across the board in the marketplace. And I needed to tell you that before the right time to tell you my opinion is when you're looking at going forward with scopes that are not under contract. Okay, well, I have Go one ahead. more question. I don't know if it has to do with where we are right now. It's assuming D3 and D4 are done, our deal is done, and we still have money. And what would be in your opinion, with what we have left, what are the most important or the most pressing things that we should do with what we have left? That's the question that I have. Well, um, and, and Pam can, you know, we, we budgeted um, the final PGMP for B3, B4. And we've reduced that budget as we've gotten prices as we've gone along. I think that um, the decisions you've made to complete the design for the high school needed to be done, not to give the architect work to do, but because it's all connected to your regulatory compliance and your final permitting. There are many reasons to do it. And I think you've made that decision. I think that 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 decision will put you in the best position in terms of DSA and DTSC. I think the decision to do the modernization of the underground, which is taking place right now, the best price you're ever gonna get is the price that's right now. Um, in 2023, 2024, we're projecting every indication that we have from third party as well as our own bidding process is another 20% beyond. That, that's, that's what uh, Ms. Johnson was trying to indicate is that what we presented to you in October is the worst case scenario if you postpone or you have a gap and the bidding is done in 23, 24. We need to tell you that if you do that, 
our projections are this is the escalation in that period. It's nothing to do with the current contracts going over budget or current contracts going over schedule. That's just not true. And you're not out of money. So I think the decisions you've made so far were good ones, in my opinion, which is do the underground and finish the design. B3, B4, and Elro Dale are in process. And I would say, uh, you might want to, if you want to take a look at the FF&E and the furniture, they, that there's some discussions about what that might be or how that might change. But I think you've made, and I pretty, you've made the decisions that I recommended to you in October. You made those decisions already. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. I appreciate it. Don, um, I can't thank you so much for all your, your information. I do have to leave, but um, I got a lot out of it. And thinking about things, and I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you for the update. Don, the issue that you talked about in regards to the foundation at B4 with the mm -hmm. liquefaction stuff, what stage are you in the reparation of that? And when do you expect that? portion to be corrected and completed? I don't know. That one could take um, uh, six weeks to four months, not to dig it out and, and take the dirt out and put the shoring in, but to do the CCD, to go to DSA, to do the remediation. If it's just putting back in good dirt and compacting it, great, probably six weeks. Um, if there's an, un if that, if the soil that we're talking about, as we dig down eight feet, and we look and we see below the footing, there's some of this material that's under a footing, whole other program. And that's what we have experienced, not all the time, but many times. When we're Thank taking you. out the, the soil, the soil that's, that has to come out. And then I also was looking over the current project estimated schedules. Mm -hmm. um, and I might have discussed this, but I was in the middle of, of reading these documents over. But it looks like you have El Rodeo um, completed December 23. Yeah, December 23. I, I couldn't judge the line here because it looked like it was okay, 24. That, no, that, 23. So final completion is 24 and substantial completion is 23. Is that correct, John? Substantial completion is 23. Right. The FF and E and the move will take place from fourth quarter 23 to the start of the next next school year, which would take you into uh, 24. But substantial so completion, I'm sorry? So the kids can be in by fall of 24, if I remember correctly. Yes, that was always the plan. That's correct. It's not 2025, I'm not sure. Maybe okay. I misspoke somewhere, but uh, it was never 2025. We moved it back from 2025 to 2023. And then my other question, just to get the, um, the order of construction along with cash flow for the high school is the, the utility transfers are getting done now. And the next project has to be the retaining walls, correct? Yes. Well, the next project I, I would recommend, and you can work that through, would be retaining wall number five in order to complete the Venico sign off from DTSC and the sign off from Calgen. And is that, can we do that um, regardless of the legacy well project? Can we start that? five, retaining all five, regardless of those wells. Yes. Okay. So um, as we move around the campus, if we start at, at the retaining all five, then we would be heading um, north along the campus, correct? Doing retaining walls. And all of those retaining walls have to be completed before building C, correct? That's correct. Okay. I just wanted to get the order involved. So can I so, just intersect, uh, interject there for a second? So uh -huh. my understanding from you and Pam previously was that we need the drawings back from DLR for the site work in order to do that. What? No. 
Well, let me uh, um, rehearse, re rehearse this again. The way we approach this is we took building C and made it a separate A number and included the pool. Uh -huh. Now we knew all along in order to build building C, we'd have to dig a hole. But there were reasons um, that uh, you and I talked about when I first met you, uh, Mr. Wells, why the decisions were made to do it that way to give the board options. Meaning the original design was three-story parking. The design was changed to one-story parking, but whether it was one-story parking or three-story parking, we had to dig the hole in order to place the building. So from a scheduling standpoint, in order to not have a gap in construction, we put building C separately, which is tied to your eminent domain case, frankly. Um, and then the retaining walls would always have to be done first in order to do building C. Again, we decided to, and we found a way to negotiate with DTSC to allow us to do those retaining walls in a footprint. In other words, this, if you imagine the retaining wall comes down and about five feet out in front of that retaining wall, DTSC would allow us to do the digging and the excavation for that specific area prior to having a completed permit for the entire site. And that planning was, that was my planning um, two years ago uh, to put together the sequencing of approval and that's why we had DSA numbers in in, in um, individual numbers. Otherwise, generally speaking, this project should have had one A number for the whole site. We actually have 12. So the purpose of it was to be able to get into DSA, get out of DSA, begin to do work, negotiate with DTSC to allow us to do that kind of make a cut for the retaining wall. Um, I just want to question. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so, so Don, my my last question is that this document that's up right now, um, mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful for the board to potentially have estimated dates so we can get these things on the agenda and we can make decisions. I, I, it's a rough, it's a rough, you know, because there's a lot to unpack here, and I think that it would be great, um, you know, uh, Dr. Brady, if, if somehow we organized all of these thoughts. And kind of put them in an order of because just because uh, you know there's there's stuff that's that's litigation based or stuff that's not and, and we just we need to sift through it and get this out and figure this out. So I just I make um, a recommendation, Noah. It um, it doesn't quite go that streamlined. I think that some of these decisions can be done without. Um, uh, the, this is board direction and this is necessarily something. These are the things that I'm bringing to you. Normally I bring to you, here's the GMAX or here's the contract or here's the subcontractor and you approve or you process that. These are things generally outside of the contracting component that have to do with direction that otherwise my team would do. But if you're going to make, you have decisions to make about who's going to do it, whether you want this program that's been delivered. And it sounds like there's some question to me about whether there's confidence in th this program or in confidence in, uh, in how any of this has been put together and that it's taken too long and it costs too much. I, okay, I mean, that's interesting. But um, if, if that's the case, then make the decisions that you need to make uh, to change that or to do something different. I wanted you to have in front of you though, as you make those decisions, here are the directions you should think about. So what I would recommend, if you don't mind, Noah, would be, hey, give us some more background on, line, on, on, on these topics. I think you guys need background, not so much board decisions and board meetings. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Um, so the Venico's retaining wall is retaining wall five, is that correct? That's correct. Um, and did you say that you have market prices for the site work? When I, when I say market prices, what I mean is that uh, during the pre-construction services activities with ProWest, they don't have a contract for any of this work, if you will, but they do have a pre-construction services 
agreement of which during that process, we went through pricing bid packages and put the packages together and got subcontractor or market prices. It's, 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 uh, it's a budget. What I'm saying is I'm not auctioning and neither is uh, pro West. It's our best information, the best level that I'm comfortable with that I can confirm that these prices are the right prices in the market based on the, on the drawings and the documents that we have. Okay. Um, well, I don't have any more questions for today, but I really appreciate your presentation and I want to thank Pam for being here as well. I'm sorry that we ran so late. Um, we really were hoping that we could uh, be out of here by six o'clock at the latest. So uh, one, one just real quick question. Dr. Brady. Um, Don, um, for the for planning for the following school year that with the with the bridge, um, is that something that will stay up through the summer and into next year and through the final construction of B3B4? Or is that something that, that you believe will come down this summer? Um, I plan to kind of talk about that in our next Thursday meeting, Dr. Bregge, because okay. we, we have priced it out and um, we want it, uh, and we're looking at uh, pr probably in the uh, putting that in the final PGMB for B3B4. And we would like to take it down during the summer. That would be definitely a tight thing to do during the summer. Um, that would be our desire. But I also, we've as we've talked about more than once in our Thursday meetings, which is great, is there may be some educational priorities that you may want or Mark Mead would want on the site. I'm assuming that's still a question. Yeah, so we're, we're just in a lot of those discussions. So I can um, uh, continue that discussion with you next Thursday. All right. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? No, I would just say there's a hefty presentation attached that we didn't go over tonight. It was attached to the agenda. I think it'll remain attached. People should get a chance to look for it. You know, we didn't get to go through it tonight. Maybe, That's what I was going to say. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Can it, do you guys care if it comes back on another board meeting? Why don't we discuss when we're going to schedule it? Yeah, that's fine. But we definitely should have I just meant meeting. The, yeah. that I just that quick expect. update could come through a regular board meeting like either through Michael's update or something. Just, just. I think we should have ongoing updates. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't, that, that, I was expecting something that dealt more with the, packet that we got in the presentation in terms of the you know, where the, there are and so on. And I just appreciated that also. Okay. Well, we could schedule All right. Well, one thank one you one. very much for lot of, um, lot of, providing that. I understand what I'm saying. Yeah. And um, we'll coordinate through I Michael. Hope to hope it's helpful another. in your decision making uh, in the next, uh, I would imagine, in the next six weeks that um, it can help you frame some of those decisions um, regarding the project base. Pam would have some uh, similar things to share with you regarding the program side, the part that she does that deals with uh, how the program and the business side works and some decisions and direction you may wanna keep in mind. Well, I really appreciate it. It's really helpful. Um, so we'll schedule when we wanna try and schedule our next um, study session, I would say, I would suggest we do another study session down the road. Um, but for tonight, I just want to thank you. It's Friday night and I appreciate you being here until seven o'clock. So uh, on that note, I'm going to adjourn the meeting and uh, say good night to everybody. See you Tuesday. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Oh, it's seven, 6.55. Yeah. Thank you. Good night.